Hello, uh, welcome to my presentation about uh, contemporary readers as interpretive communities. And as the headline suggests, I'm going to talk about interpretation, a um, subject that I feel that we don't talk enough about. Um, and I can understand it because interpretations are hard to quantify and it's hard to talk them uh, about them subjectively. Uh, objectively, uh, there is uh, something very subjective about uh, literary interpretations. Um, but even though I'm going to brave through and, and talk about interpretations, um, the work I'm going to show you is in the making. So um, it wouldn't be as uh, fine-grained as it can be. Uh, so the numbers are not the main thing, the main finding. The main uh, thing I want to show you is the approach that I'm taking uh, to interpretation and uh, the way interpretations can be grouped together and can be discussed about what lies beneath uh, the interpretations. Uh, this experiment uh, is uh, the experiment that I talked about last year. Uh, you can uh, scroll down and and link to and see the link to the last year uh, talk. Um, the experiment was about medieval Hebrew poetry. Readers uh, read four poems and rank them on different indices and also answer the question what was the poem about and here i'm going to show you answers to one poem and what people th thought it was about the poem is this poem uh, by shmuel and Agid. it's called halinotik dud kaved babira if you know hebrew you can read uh, the poem here you can stop the video and read the poem um, if you don't know Hebrew, you can uh, read the translation here. This is the official translation by uh, Peter Cole. Um, there is, you can stop here and read this translation, but you can also uh, read the more literal translation that I made. And you can stop here and read the translation. <coughs> uh, the original poem is a bit hard to understand in Hebrew because if about a thousand years passed since uh, it was written and the Hebrew language uh, changed and also the norms of how poetry is written have changed since the medieval times. So it's a bit hard to understand, which makes it ideal for uh, research about interpretation because there are these gaps in the poem that uh, readers need to feel, fill with uh, their interpretation. Uh, the poem itself um, is kind of a, a poetic memento mori. It's about uh, the poet, which is also, who is also a, a soldier or a general, uh, takes his troops to a castle, a ruined castle, and they sleep over there at night. And over the night, he thinks a lot of philosophical, sad thoughts about life and death and uh, how everything ends and all these dead people in the ground and he and his soldier will also one day um, be dead and it's about the meaningless the meaningless of life i, I think and um a, a lot of the readers also thought this thought um and agreed with me and with the literary interpretations uh, the common interpretation of the song and you you can see here you can also stop and read a few of, the, of these answers and what was interesting uh, for me about this is that uh, they kind of got it right and understood the, the poem as it supposedly was understood by uh, its contemporaries. And it, it, it was nice and even a bit exciting to see that even today, a lot of people uh, understood the poem in this way. This was the largest group of uh, interpretations. Um, but even more exciting was the people that understood uh, the poem differently. Um, this group is also quite big. Um, and these people uh, saw the poem as a poem about war, about occupation and about uh, pacifism. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you can see here readers that I thought that the thoughts over, over the night of the general weren't about life, uh, but about um, the injustice of war and 
uh, the side that he takes in the war and you, you can even see here um, with re reader number four that it's uh, so simple and so true even today um, th this the notion that it's uh, actualic uh, uh, the poem is uh, is interesting and I, I think that there are uh, two reasons why people read the poem uh, like this uh, first of all that they didn't have the um, uh, they didn't know enough about medieval poetry because uh, in the medieval times this kind of poem uh, was very common and the sentiment that uh, we are all going to die and life is meaningless and therefore um, all we have is the afterlife and God. Um, th this notion was very basic and a lot of poems deal with it. So when uh, readers saw the poem or, or heard it, uh, more likely, uh, they knew from the beginning what the poem is about. Oh, there is a ruined castle and uh, it's in the night. So it's probably about th that life is meaningless. And uh, these days readers don't know to um, interpret this, these signs. They don't have the her hermeneutics uh, of the medieval times. Uh, so this is one thing, that there was a gap that people needed to fill. Uh, but they can't fill it, as we saw before. They can't do it with uh, the same sentiment, but they don't automatically use this sentiment. And another thing is that uh, the notion that war is a horrible thing and a lot of life are ruined and wasted in war is a very uh, actualic notion especially uh, for israelis that live in uh, this reality and uh, also uh, doubt sometimes the side that they are on and think of the horrible outcomes of occupation at least some kind of Israelis uh, do have these notions and I think that the people that come to th that answer uh, experiments about literature perhaps more a bigger percent of, of them feel these notions uh, so the, the poem was read from the present uh, in this sense and, uh, I, and I think that this reading is very far from uh, the original meaning uh, in the way that the original meaning is anti-humanistic, human life is worthless, and this reading is very humanistic, it's human-centric, I mean, life is very meaningful and therefore it's uh, tragic, the loss during wars. Um, even, even though uh, this reading is possible, I think, it wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't learn it in a textbook, uh, the text doesn't uh, point you there, but it's possible, perhaps. But the next reading is, is stretching it a bit uh, further. I guess uh, this was uh, people that thought that the poem was about Jerusalem. I must admit that I was surprised when I saw these readings, especially because the word Jerusalem isn't in the poem and the the Jerusalem has a lot of nicknames, none of them appears in the poem, and no interpretation of, of the poem by a literary critic would dream to put Jeruz the poem in Jerusalem because historically Jerusalem was very far and Shmuel and didn't go to war in Jerusalem and so on and so forth. But uh, when I try to understand why so many, not a lot, but very, you know, 17 is, is, is a respectable group of people thought that it was about Jerusalem. First of all, it's because of the word Bira in the poem, Halinotik Dud Bebira. In ancient Hebrew, Bira meant a castle, but in modern Hebrew, Bira means capital. So a lot of readers thought that the word Bira means a, a big city, a capital city. Uh, even I thought that that when I read uh, the poem in the first place. And you can also see in the answers that the word city um, it comes, I think, 80 times in the answers and the words for castle only three or four times. So most readers thought that it's about a city, even 
the readers that uh, in the last two interpretations thought that it's about the city and not about the castle. Um, but the word pira uh, also takes you uh, to Jerusalem if you live in Israel, because this is your capital. And the, the word pira goes a lot with Jerusalem, Yerushalayim Habira in modern Hebrew. Uh, so it's tempting to take it to Jerusalem, but the temptation uh, became even greater because of two other reasons. Uh, the first is that even though medieval Hebrew poetry mostly isn't about Jerusalem, there are two very famous songs, uh, poems, uh, that do speak about uh, uh, Jerusalem, uh, which are Libi uh, Mizrach, and Tzion uh, uh, Ali. These two works by Yudah um, Levi are very popular, uh, especially I think because of Zionism that puts the spotlight on um, the longing for uh, Jerusalem and the land of Israel over the last 2000 years. So it, it got over represented in the minds of readers, especially if they don't know a lot about medieval Hebrew poetry, which are most of the subjects in our experiment. So uh, they did have the explanation that the poem is about Jerusalem in their minds, in the back of their minds as a, a possible explanation for Hebrew uh, medieval poetry. And another thing is that the uh, castle in the poem resembles Jerusalem in some senses, uh, especially uh, because it's an old city that was ruined a lot of times, ruined and built and ruined and built with a lot of graves under the ground. And even the idea of uh, uh, dead people coming out of their graves uh, is suitable for Jerusalem because of uh, the prophecies that in the end of days the dead will come out of their graves uh, in Jerusalem. So it's not that far-fetched as I thought in the beginning. Um, and you, you can see that the readers put their uh, time, the current time and uh, what they, they knew in these current times inside the way that they interpret uh, the poem. Yet the next kind of interpretation uh, goes even further. These are interpretations uh, that put uh, gender in the forefront. And for example, uh, you, you can see uh, in the first answer that the, that the poem is about on the rise and fall of nations and men. Uh, or for example, in the second uh, answer, uh, Dryden likens the city to a woman one has sex rape with. So how did they get there? Um, I also uh, have a few interpretations of this this interpretation. First of all is because that uh, feminist reading and feminist interpretations are very common these days. It is uh, learned in the university, for example, and it's also uh, common in uh, culture criticism. Um, and another thing is uh, Popular um, movements like uh, Me Too uh, also uh, change the, the discourse and the way that people read texts. And in, in this poem, uh, you do have uh, some of the features of the Hebrew language, which is gender, gendered. So um, city and castle are uh, feminine, and uh, the people that are talked about in the poem are in a masculine form um, from, from a linguistic point of view. Uh, so some of the gender critique in Hebrew is about this kind of uh, practice in the language and which are the, uh, the plural form uh, that you use. It is a topic in debate uh, in Israel. It's a very lively debate on how do you call a, a group of people uh, which have uh, male and female, if it's you call them by the feminine plural or the masculine plural. Uh, so in this poem uses a lot the masculine plural. Sarim, avadim, banim, hurim. And not the feminine, so it it can, it could like ting uh, this uh, open uh, vein in the in, in the mind. Um, 
I don't think this is uh, the best kind of interpretation for this poem, but in the experiment we did have uh, two lost poems uh, that got much more uh, gender uh, interpretation, and in those cases I must admit the gender critique was on the spot. I mean, there are a lot of um, things that just can't fly the same way these days as they did a thousand years ago. Um, so even, even though in this case the uh, gender interpretation is a bit, I think it goes a, a bit too far or it, it's not very connected to uh, what the poem is about. Uh, the fact that there is this kind of interpretation even for uh, this poem is, uh, is interesting. And uh, the next uh, kind of interpretations are uh, what I call here uh, idiosyncratic interpretations. These are um, interpretations that can't be grouped uh, in any other group because just one person uh, interpreted uh, the poem this way. Uh, I think these interpretations go uh, farther away from the main uh, two, two interpretations that I, I talked about in the beginning. Some of them are a bit ridiculous. Uh, for example, the one that talks about uh, beer as bira, the, the drink. It takes the word bira, and it, which is spelled exactly like bira in Hebrew. Um, and the, the song is about making the soldiers drunk. But the main thing for me with these interpretations is the fact that there are not a lot of them which is, is a bit surprising because it's a poem very ancient and a lot of sh shifts in the Hebrew language and uh, the, the, uh, the fact that you don't have that much idiosyncratic interpretations is, is, is very surprising. I mean, if you read um, what people said about interpretations, for example, A.I. Richard, Richards from the uh, New Critique, uh, he, he wrote a book about uh, in interpretations and he said that every reader reads differently. And even in reader response, uh, sometimes we see the notion that the uh, interpretation is idiosyncratic. So what we see here is that the main interpretations are the closer ones, the groups of interpretations that are closer to the um, common interpretation by literary critics, and as further you go, the groups get smaller and smaller. For me, this was uh, surprising and very uh, optimistic. And we also have a, a very small group of readers that say that they didn't uh, understand anything. I think that the rest of the readers that didn't understand anything just uh, didn't answer this question. Uh, and more people didn't answer the question, just didn't feel like uh, answering in writing them about stuff they just liked answering in this case. So um, my take home message for you is about interpretive communities, um, a term that was coined by Stanley Fish. An interpretive community is a, a community of people that uh, read and interpret in the same way, uh, perhaps because of uh, the practice that they uh, learned. Uh, if they went to university and they were taught to read uh, in a certain way, or uh, because of cultural dependent knowledge. I think that the readers in medieval times and the readers today, they are definitely from different interpretive communities. I, I showed you a few reasons. Um, words in Hebrew that change and uh, knowledge about interpretation that change and also ideologies uh, that change. And you, you can see, if you read uh, into these interpretations, you can see these changes in the way that they uh, made people uh, read or encouraged uh, certain interpretations. And uh, I think that this uh, notion of interpretive communities can uh, explain a lot of things if we try to 
compare readings of two cultures of or of two uh, periods which we don't uh, usually do but um, if we as a community go a bit further in uh, doing experiments not just uh, in one language or in one culture but uh, to compare practices of reading and uh, of interpreting in different cultures then I think we would need this uh, notion of interpretive communities and the, the way that I did it uh, here could be uh, refined more I guess and uh, could be used in a more um, rigorous uh, way definitely it could be uh, but the idea is uh, the same basic idea to gather interpretations and then to to group them and try to understand why people uh, in different cultures or different times read this way and i think that this can help us um, to bridge gaps between cultures or between uh, current readers and ancient texts and i would like to uh, discuss this more with you um, in my talk very soon in Monopoly. Thank you very much.